So thanks to the colleagues here. It was amazing to hear, to be able to listen to that uh, little cafe discussion. Um, and um, it's, I think, a unique opportunity to have the opportunity to listen to those stories. And I think that doesn't happen enough. I don't know how many of you were actually in the negotiations the past week. Maybe you can actually show hands who of you have been really negotiating. At least following negotiations closely, then maybe. <laughs> yeah, so that's at least a, a slightly larger show of hands. But there's many people, the really privileged people that arrived yesterday or even this morning to come and listen to this. Because actually, this is what it's about. And um, I think it's telling that we've got 14,000 people in the negotiations that don't come to listen here. But it is also our task to build those bridges and to get the connections between these sorts of stories and uh, the stories in the, uh, in the negotiations, the discussion of negotiations. And that is partly knowing about the challenges, but partly also bringing the solutions that can be connected there, and also bringing the evidence forward on uh, exactly how we need to understand these problems, but also what sort of solutions we can bring forward. And I think one of the things that was so powerful about the IPCC report that uh, Bruce already introduced, and that we'll be hearing more about in a minute, is that it started making those connections. And I think in that sense we're in a very, very special time frame where um, it's more clear than ever that time is running out, the level of ambition is not high enough for exactly what we, what we heard is, is already happening today. That also generates a certain awareness that we now actually do need to find that, that ambition somewhere. And you heard already from Claire about the processes underway, especially in the coming year, where we can frame that ambition. And we can do that if we manage to connect what we just heard to those global processes. And that is our collective job. It's not good enough for us to be here for two days and talk to each other. That is really valuable, and I cherish that opportunity, and I think we will all go back having been inspired by each other and doing better things on the ground. We also need to lift that up to this global level. I want to make a special plea. We will be looking for the evidence that needs to be brought to these global processes over the course of the coming two days. Celine, who's sitting in the middle there, and I will be moderating the final panel. Um, and we will be in a position to ask some of the questions also to some of the people sitting close to those global processes. Um, as Claire was saying, we'll have someone from the Global Commission on Adaptation Secretary, for instance. We will be able to ask them, so these are, this is our analysis of some of these problems, these are some of our solutions. How are you going to be taking those into that level of ambition that needs to be generated in the coming, the coming uh, year, but, but of course also beyond. Um, so keep that in mind in your discussions in the coming two days. I think we also have an opportunity to better use the existing interfaces we have. And I think I was, I was mentioning the 1.5 report, we're, we're now starting a, an AR6 cycle that will result in reports that will inform the, the updating of the Paris Agreement in 2023. And we, we have an IPCC that is looking at this question of how it's relevant to this global ambition in a, a very different way. And you've seen that in the 1.5 report. I think Bruce was spot on. Two, three years ago, we had no idea how this was going to happen, but look at what we've got in front of us. And it is partly because we've got an IPCC that is actually keen to talk about an analysis that matters to people actually facing these issues on the ground, but also an analysis, an evidence-based analysis of the solutions that we can bring to bear. And it is partly where I think we have a missing year also in the leadership of the IPCC for some of the evidence that maybe was still finding a way even of how to do this before. I think we, we now have that opportunity. We also have an obligation on us in a way to make some of our evidence and our knowledge available to those processes. And I think what we can do the coming two years, two days, is to talk about some of those messages and some of the evidence that needs to be brought forward. We also have to do our homework bringing more of it into, ideally, the really peer-reviewed scientific literature, but otherwise at least work through mechanisms to bring more of that to the fore. And we know that the white spots in the scientific evidence are still the places where we are most vulnerable, as, as we also just heard. So that is a charge, I think, for all of us. Um, but again, I'm more encouraged by the progress we're making there. Um, at the same time, the problem may be growing faster than the progress we're making. So I think we still need to be very aware that we've got a lot more to do. Yet, at the same time, I'm, I'm super um, excited about the steps we are making, and the IPCC has been a very important part of that. 
Um, and I'm really honored to now introduce Deborah Roberts, the co-chair of IPCC Working Group, working group 2 on um, impacts uh, vulnerability and adaptation. Um, and I think she embodies the fact that we are now building these bridges. She was a negotiator for South Africa. She was the chief resilience officer in the city of Durban, really confronting some of these challenges at the local level, but also looking for practical solutions that would work for people locally. So um, having people like her in those, uh, in those spaces is, is really unique. Um, and it's amazing to have such fantastic spokespeople also for those bridges, but also for that scientific evidence. Um, we had the honor of having Deborah with us in uh, Geneva recently at a climate science and humanitarian dialogue where the humanitarian community that is confronted by these rising risks but still not so aware of the science, for instance, in an IPCC report, was being briefed about what, this, uh, what the findings are and, and what would meant to them. Uh, one of the interesting things is that um, on the evening we had a public event, lots of young people also from, from Geneva and surroundings coming to listen. Uh, and um, we were preparing that panel, and uh, at some point, someone from one of the missions that was involved also invited all the diplomats. I think we have a problem. We might have an all male panel, and, and, and in, in our, uh, our world, that's really no longer, uh, no longer okay. I and mean, how we're going to fix this? Uh, yeah, we've got the Dutch ambassador, the Swiss ambassador, and then we've got the uh, vice president of ICRC, and then we've got these two IPCC scientists. I said, yeah, so what's the problem? Well, I mean, we would have more male panel. <laughs> and it was not in people's minds that we now actually have leadership. Uh, of course, it's pre programmed in the IPCC that we have leadership from the South, but uh, I think we have a gender balance in, in, the, in the IPCC working groups as well. Uh, and um, uh, both Valerie from Work Group 1 and Deborah from Work Group 2 were, were the most inspiring advocates that we could have for this agenda. And um, it was interesting how uh, it, was, it was sort of in people's minds that you would not have that sort of leadership in the IPCC. It was also really interesting to, to see the discussions there, also really landing in that humanitarian community. And it's not used to getting science in a way that connects to every other. So uh, once again, Deborah, it's fantastic to have someone like you bridging the hard scientific evidence and the decision-making across all those levels. Um, and uh, I'm really honored to now um, ask you to uh, tell us a bit about I think both the contents of the IPCC report, but also where you think we need to take that, both in our work on the ground, but also in what we need to tell 